everybody. Welcome to episode 17 of All About African Violets. Welcome to my sunroom. How are you? It's not sunny, it's night, but uh, I thought I would do this now and uh, get it ready for you for Sunday morning. It's Friday night. And uh, I've just come back from going to see Second City on tour. It was a lot of fun and, uh, and very funny in many parts. Um, I know I'm not supposed to mention a train, but of course, I just sat down and now there's a train. That rumbling is, is a train going by. Um, All About African Violets is musically sponsored by Ted Yoder. You can hear his wonderful music and purchase it if you choose to on his website at tedyoder.com. How was your week? I hope you had a great week. I sure did. I've just, I had a great week. Um, you know, the weather here in Chicagoland, it, it can't quite decide if it's gonna be fall or if it's gonna be summer again. It's a little, it cooled off and it's raining and uh, and now it's gonna warm up again this coming week. So it's, it's kind of that back and forth at this time of year. But um, it, it has been a busy week. I got a box of joy in the mail. I'm gonna go right into tips and treasures because I'm not gonna talk too long to you today. I am going to um, turn the camera over, so to speak, um, to Kent Stork. I'm going to share with you the interview that I did with him at Missouri Valley, and I think you're going to enjoy it. He is very interesting. Um, he is very, very knowledgeable. Kent and his wife Joyce are the authors of You Can Grow African Violets. They wrote the beginner's column in the African Violet magazine for years and their book is a compilation of those of those columns. Kent is also, as well as being a tremendous grower, is also a very well-known hybridizer and um, if you've grown plants for any length of time you've probably grown some of his. I, I love to grow his plants so I uh, there is ambient noise in the background and you will see a couple people walk by um, during the interview but um, you know it's kind of hard when you're in a hotel at a place like that to try to get a quiet spot and uh, so I am going to really just kind of zip right over to that right now. The interview is about 15-20 minutes long and uh, I'll be back on the other side. Enjoy! Hi, you guys. I'm here with Kent Stork. He has agreed to sit down and talk to us a little bit about African violets. Kent, thank you so much. Why, sure. This is awesome. So, you know, I would really like to know how or why, or maybe both, did you get interested in African violets? Long time ago, when Joyce and I were both teaching school mm -hmm. out of college, mm -hmm. um, we were in a small town in central Nebraska, and when we were moving on after that, the pastor from our church, who was a member of ABSA, no gave us an African violet as a going away present. Oh. And we killed it. I'm so glad to hear this because the first one I had, I <laughs> didn't do so well either, well, remember? And, and the thing was, having killed it, we moved to Lincoln, I went to the library and found a book on African violets because I was determined to find out what we had done wrong. Okay. And then after getting all that information, then when I think it was the Lincoln African Violet Society was selling some plants mm -hmm. and I don't know if it was their show or if it was maybe just part of a garden club show or something, mm -hmm. you know, a sale, um, we picked up a few plants and got a small fluorescent light fixture to start mm -hmm. out. That's how and it starts, that's isn't it? that's where it began, yeah. Okay, that sounds kind of similar to me. I mean, I, I was given one as a gift, and I didn't kill that the first one, but it, I couldn't get it to bloom again. Yeah, well, and you know, with this, having found that book in the library, we got, I had really good information to work with, and having that light fixture, it was so rewarding. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those little 24 inch I know, that's fixtures. what I have. I still yeah. have my first one. And it just, it just went on from there. That's great. Yeah. Well, do you have a favorite plant, Ken? That's hard, I know. It's like, <laughs> that's how do you pick a, you like, so like a baby, many. how do you pick the favorite, you know? Um, 
I think my favorite one to grow is probably smooch me. It's, which is one of my you own know what, hybrids. I love that plant, and I, I speak highly of it all the time. I and love to grow it. It's not like it has that spectacular blossom. Oh, I disagree. I think it's spectacular. Well, I love that dark center. Um, it grows well. I mean, yeah. it loves my growing mm -hmm. conditions. I don't have to worry about, mm -hmm. you know, the thing performing. As a seedling on the shelf, it had wonderful symmetrical foliage okay. and I noticed the plant before it ever even bloomed okay. and most of the time doing my hybridizing I wait until seedlings bloom mm -hmm. and give them a little time to see how they're going to be before I start putting leaves down that was the seedling I started putting leaves down from right away right because away. the foliage was so good well you know, this brings up another question and I, I'm not trying it's not one that we did kind of go over the questions you guys so Kent wouldn't be nervous <laughs> But, and this wasn't one of them, but it's an easy question. I mean, do you, because I've talked about this before on the podcast, I personally love to grow your hybrids. I like them, I think they're beautiful, and they grow really well for me. And I've often found that things, that plants that were hybridized in a certain area that maybe has a, a relatively similar climate to where I'm living seem to do better. Do you Ab oh, find that to be true? Absolutely. You know, through the years, I've tried stuff from lots of different hybridizers, mm -hmm. and there might be a plant or two, if it's, you know, completely different climate, that will actually do well for me, but they don't for the most part. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. things that are hybridized way down south where they have a lot of heat and humidity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe it'll plant it'll be a plant that'll do well for me during the summer months, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but overall for growing really nice plants, they just don't perform. I'm really glad well. to hear you say that because that's what I felt instinct instinctively. That it was, it seemed to like my conditions and my growing. You know, I live in, in the Midwest like you and Joyce do. And so that's it's very and, you interesting. You know, especially I think it applies to the variegated ones. Because okay. Okay. if you live in an area where you have cooler temperatures and you're trying to grow a variegated plant that variegates well for the hybridizer, say in Texas or Louisiana or Florida or wherever, mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. like that, you bring it into our growing conditions where it's much cooler and so often those plants will become so variegated that they just lose they just all their vigor. They can't go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, how do you grow your plants? I mean, do you, I mean, obviously you started with a, a, a little, you know, 24 inch light, like I did, mm -hmm. a little 24, mm -hmm. one by two stand. What do you do now? What's, is do you use a system? Do you wick water? Do you saucer water? What do you do? <laughs> what are you I, like eight million I, plants here? The twenty-five thousand saucers. I employ water. <laughs> That's one of the great advantages to being a commercial grower is that you've got help doing this stuff, and especially in our flower shop. We can go weeks at a time when we are so crazy busy with holidays, or if we get a whole string of funerals in town, or whatever, that. Sometimes I go weeks at a time without actually getting any work done with the violets. Okay, but so it's else it's is all it's on all on a system so that an employee can water them. It's what I do when I divide off my little starter plants, they mm -hmm. go into small two and a quarter inch pots mm -hmm. in a tray and mm -hmm. are covered with plastic bags for about a month or okay. so while they get established. And then they go in trays and they are bottom watered. I have an employee who just pours water into those trays. Are they on matting, Kent? No. They're just no, in they're a tray. They're just in trays. And are they wicked? No. They're just no, in the tray. Okay. Just just in the trays. But you're growing like an entire tray of these are going to be plants that are going to go for sale. Right. Like you're going to bring or, to a show or like ones here. that or ones that I'm going to pot up okay. into four inch pots okay. later on. Okay. And what she does, she pours a lot of water into the tray and lets them sit for maybe 45 minutes or so and then drains off all the extra water. Okay. From that they go into four inch pots and then, they, then they're wicked and they're put on trays with matting. Okay so you skip the three inch pot you go right from a, a, a weeny, teeny weeny pot up to four inch once it's, it's big it's enough. It's not the best way but it's what I have time to do. Get it. Okay. I get so, that. You know, and I the, start, the starter yeah. plants are a good size when yes. they get 
get moved up. I can um, vouch for that because yeah. I've purchased starter plants from you before. And you know, then they go after they have matured and are starting to grow on the matted trays. Then I move them onto trays where the wicks dangle down through a wire through like grid a into the water. water. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Very cool. Okay. And and you know the employees can can help can fill the <laughs> trays. So yeah. Okay, that's the trick, you guys. We need employees. What is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, I think it's really important, even when you're wicking, that you need to pour water through. You occasionally? Need, you need to water from the top occasionally, yeah, okay. otherwise you get fertilizer buildups and then you can okay. run into a lot of problems. And when that. you say occasionally, do you mean like once a month? Once a month would be would be ideal, would be wouldn't ideal, it? but it doesn't okay. just doesn't. How often happen. ever you it can just get it? Okay. Happen. Yeah. Well, you know, do you feel that you have a specialty first as a grower and then as a hybridizer? I think my philosophy of growing. When I look at a plant, a variety that I'm thinking about growing, mm -hmm. I look at the foliage first. I want a plant that's going to grow nicely. We, we agree on and, that respect, and yeah. The, you know, an interesting, everybody loves great blossoms, and sometimes you try growing great plants of varieties that have really interesting blossoms and it just doesn't happen because they don't have that foundation of having good foliage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the same kind of thing that I look for in my hybridizing. I expect my plants to be able to be grown into show plants. And there have been seedlings that I have had that have had really unusual blossoms, but it's stuff that I just dump because I know that nobody's going to be able to grow them into really nice plants. Okay. okay. There's some that get through that, you know, I think later on, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. But there's there's been plenty that I just have okay. not let go of. Okay. Do you feel that you are more, I mean, I think of you as a standard grower and, and more than a semi-mini grower. And I know that that's really not true because you really do grow all types. Do you have a, a, a favorite in that respect? Of, do you like to grow standards more oh, than you like to grow? You know what? I admire semi-miniatures. I, I love looking at those beautiful little plants. But let's face it, I'm a commercial grower. A semi-miniature takes just as much time, maybe even more time, to grow into a nice looking plant as a standard. And you can't get as much money for them. Okay. Okay. I am in business. I, I get I that. That business. makes perfect sense. You know, what advice? I mean, you and Joyce have taught so many people. You guys are, are the authors of You Can Grow African Violets, which is a phenomenal book. And it's a compilation of your columns that you wrote for the mm -hmm. AVSA magazine, right? For, for African yeah. Violet magazine. What advice would you give a beginning grower? Something Don't grow too a, many. Limit Don't your grow collection. Too many. Wait, so we we <laughs> talked about this on the podcast before. Limit your collection. Thank you. I didn't, I'll pay you later. <laughs> I did not pay him to say that, you guys. I have seen so many times over the years new growers who were so enthusiastic and they were buying everything in sight and trying to grow way too much and they found they were in over their heads. Mm -hmm. And nothing looked good because mm -hmm. they couldn't keep up with all of it, and eventually mm -hmm. they stopped growing. Mm -hmm. Becomes more frustrating. Exactly. It's not a source of joy and, anymore. And, you know, everybody runs through periods in their life where there's a lot of stress. There was a time a number of years ago when Joyce had surgery, and she was out of the shop for like a month and a half, mm -hmm. and I was having to manage all the floral stuff. and and I did not do a thing with the violets. And they just looked awful. It was so depressing. Mm -hmm. And what I had to do was I had to go through, I had to throw stuff out, mm -hmm. and eventually all of us at the shop, employees and everybody, we went through and cleaned everything up, picked all the dead leaves off, and, and then I repotted everything, and it was a major job. But you just have to learn there are times that you have to scale back and you have to limit yourself and not mm -hmm. try to do more than you can mm -hmm. do well. 
I think that that is such great advice. Thank you for that. I, because and because I've experienced it myself, and it, because it's something that I work with in my own collection, and that we've talked about here on the podcast as well uh, many times, that what all of a sudden you have too many. I'm looking right now at 63 leaves that are having babies, and I'm thinking, oh, Annie, what were you thinking? You know, well, and- but. When you're starting over and you're starting from leaves, you got to have some place to start, and then yeah. and then you get hooked on the hobby because it's a joy. Yeah, it really when is. When it becomes a, a burden, it's not fun. That's right. So you need to learn to hold back enough so that you're really enjoying what you're working with and what you're doing. Okay. How did you become interested in hybridizing? When I know you grow violets, and, and for those of you guys who don't know, Kent and Joyce are florists in Nebraska. Their shop is called Kent's Flowers, and I will link to it in the show notes so that you guys can check it out. But, you know, how did you decide to become a hybridizer? What, what brought that on? Uh, you know, I think it probably goes back a long time ago. Just curiosity Mm -hmm. Um, it was something I hadn't tried before I just wanted wanted to see what I got what happened and the first time that I ever exhibited one of my own hybrids at an AVSA convention show on a display table Mm -hmm. I had all sorts of other plants that came from other hybridizers but my hybrid, which was just a lavender on dark foliage, won the ribbon for being the best plant on the table. Awesome. That was that was that, encouraging. That was really encouraging. And then, it's, I think being a hybridizer is something that's kind of built into you, because you start things are working in your head with with you learn what's dominant, what's recessive, and you start playing with things. And you never know for sure what you're going to get. Sometimes you make a cross with two really interesting plants, and you don't get anything that's worth keeping out of it. Sometimes you make a cross, and you just get a wealth. You just get all sorts of things that are wonderful plants. So you never know what's going to happen. So it's like a puzzle. It is. And just, you know, as an example of that, when we got to go to... Russia and Ukraine a few years ago and visit with some of the African (laughs) violet clubs there. We fell in love with a plant called Prekrasnia Kriolka, which means beautiful Creole. And it's a vibrant, deep, deep blue blossom Mm. with ruffled greenish white edges. It's just 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 amazing. And we got to speak to the hybridizer, and she had crossed two plants with lavender blossoms and got this vivid dark blue. So it was one of those where the recessive genes that were in those plants came together and made this spectacular plant. And I have not sold any of them to anybody yet. You're hoarding them. <laughs> I'm, work, well, You're hoarding I'm, them. I'm working on getting it into production because I know when I do start selling it, it's going to sell like wildfire. Wow. So I have to build up a stock. Okay, guys, you can be, be on the lookout. <laughs> be on the lookout. I'll let you know. I'll I told you, I'm in business. I've got to keep know, these things in I mind. Know. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to tell the podcast audience? Anything you think they should know about growing violets? Oh, I think the main thing is there's always going to be something new. Mm-hmm. Something, something awful that's going to happen that you're going to learn from. Oh, you know what? You just brought up so, a really good point. So I'm not going to let you get away yet. Are you willing to share a little bit about what happened to you? You know, I started the podcast earlier this year because I was starting over. I lost my whole collection, most likely to what we think is micronutrient toxicity, as I mentioned before. But other people around the country have also had very odd and different and strange things occur. And Kent, you struggled with some of that. Are you willing to share a little bit about that? <laughs> yes, I, am I think putting this, you is, on the spot this now. is something I, people need to know about. This, you guys. Um, it started probably a couple of years ago 
when I had plants where leaves or sections of leaves were withering and it, it was acting like a fungus. Uh, if you've ever had major any major problems with powdery mildew, mm -hmm. you see the powder mm -hmm. on top of the leaf. And there's and, and, yeah. and there's many different strains mm -hmm. of powdery mildew. They're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And some of them re you don't really see the powder on the leaf. Mm -hmm. You just see the damage. Well, I was seeing pock marking and stuff on the surface of the leaves and I thought, okay, this is one of those mildew situations. And when you're treating mildew, you have to treat with the right fungicide. Okay. Because okay. there's no one no thing one that's going small. to cover okay. everything. Okay. So I kept, you know, trying different fungicides, trying to find the one that was going to control it, and things kept getting worse and worse and worse. I was, I lost so many varieties, a lot of my own I hybrids. I threw out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants. Makes me sad just to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I and know. I haven't grown a big show plant in several years. I know. It takes know. time to recover from something like that. But anyway, um, we had one of my local club members who took a look at one of my plants, and he had lived out somewhere else for a while, belonged to a different club, and somebody there had had a problem with foliar thrips. Now, foliar thrip is different than the kind that, that usually sucks they, the pollen that, uh, out of the... They do not affect the blossoms at all. They're a tiny little insect. One, one is a thrips. <laughs> right. So, But they're tiny little green thrips. Mm -hmm. And having done a little reading on the internet, there apparently are Chilean green thrips okay. that came into the country and got into Florida. And since most of the green plants that get dispersed around the country are propagated that's that in pipeline Florida, that comes through there. They, okay. Yeah, it all comes through there. Okay. So apparently that's you know how they've gotten around the country. But anyway, he knew what they were, okay. and he looked at one of your one of my plants, and he said, "I think this is what you've got." And what they do is they tend to attack when you have overlapping leaves. So the regular rosette form of right, the plant. Right, right. Okay. They attack the surface of the leaf that's underneath because they don't like the light. Oh. And what they'll do is, you know, examine or pretend that this, this is a leaf and this is the stem. They tend to mm -hmm. attack right in there where the stem attaches to the so leaf the, and they spread out. Where the petiole, mm -hmm. okay. But you take a magnifying glass and you can see those little, little boogers there. <laughs> little beasties. But the main thing was, at least I found out what they were and then I could start treating for them. Okay. Because I, you, neem I have found is is very effective neem and it's oil? A safer. Yeah, actually, I started with neem oil and I've got another. I don't have the stuff here. I don't remember the name of it. It's a derivative of neem. Of neem. Okay. And it works. It. And that's because neem sometimes kind of clumps up or leaves yeah. little bits of white stuff on the foliage, okay. and this stuff doesn't. Okay. It's a lot more expensive. Oh, it's always <laughs> to me, that to me always it's the worth way. It. Yeah. But well, that can I get the info from you? I can put. Is yeah. it commercially available? Yes. For people? Yeah. I could put it in yeah. the show notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do that, guys. I'll put it in the show yeah. notes. So anyway, you know, after working, treating with that stuff for several months, things are healthy again, and I've got my first seed pod set in several years, oh, and there should be ripening in the next month, and I can hardly wait to see what I get out of it. That is so exciting. <laughs> Kent, thank you so oh, much sure. for spending this time with me and with, for, with everybody on the podcast. You guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Kent Stork. I will leave some more info, info um, about uh, Kent's flowers on the show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Wow, what did you think? I hope you enjoyed that. He has... Kent has just so much knowledge and he's always so willing to share it. And um, how about it? Limit your collection. Well, I'm one to talk because this week my friend Derek sent me a box of joy, a box of African violet leaves and um, cut and plants, plantlets and suckers. And it was just unbelievable. It, it was just wonderful. Um, he, he's a viewer of the podcast. Hi, Derek. How are you? 
um, thank you, you rock. And he sent, he sent me a note and said that um, he, after I did the episode where I talked about the plants that are in the beginning of the podcast, and I had mentioned Fisherman's Paradise and how much I loved it and how sorry I was to have lost it, um, he wrote and said that he had um, a, a large sucker from a plant that he would be willing to share with me. And what a, a wonderful gift. And uh, we got to talking a little bit and I ended up with a box full of stuff. So wait, I, I'm just, I shall show it to you shortly here in, in just a moment so that you can see it. But uh, this puts my collection at a, a hefty 90 odd varieties. But as I've said in the past, I know that I won't keep all of, all of the plants that come from these leaves I've been putting down. But when you are starting over, you do have to have something to start with. So it's kind of nice to have a few more things to, to add, something to add back. And uh, so I hope you'll enjoy seeing that. And it is time to take a look at what's on the stands. So there's lots of stuff, lots of stuff. I'll see you in just a moment. Hi everybody, I'm here in my kitchen. It's Wednesday night, actually, and uh, you're looking at Christmas in October. <laughs> Thanks to Derek, uh, who sent me a, a really just this huge prize package of leaves. Um, I've got my work cut out for me. Uh, he tempted me with a plant of um, Fisherman's Paradise, which is, if you'll recall, when we when I did the uh, when I showed you guys the, the, the flowers that are in the podcast um, in the beginning, it, it's been one of my favorites forever and I lost it. And, and he tempted me with that and then said, well, I've got a few other things. And but who knew? I mean, look at this. This is amazing. And, uh, and I also picked up, I, I got these in the mail this week. This is supposedly the Sininja, I'm sorry, the Smithiantha cinnabarina species plant and I, I had to get two of them because I had to do a minimum order so um, it's it's about 20 after 6 and I guess I'll be uh, working here most of the night trying to figure out what's going on here and uh, getting everything in order but I wanted to share it with you now all right I'll uh, either I'll show you what's next or you'll see me next okay hi everybody you've just seen the box of joy that arrived earlier this week and now it's time to take a look at what's on the stands. Here are the show plants that came home with me and everybody's looking just fine and uh, doing well. And then up here, a couple changes. Here's Sultan. It's gonna bloom. We'll see. Um, here's a little Comanche girl also going to bloom. And here's a little Inca girl. I think it's a little Inca girl. Let's take a look. Whoa, she said as she knocked it over. Yes, it's a little Inca girl. And you can see it was starting to reach up and so, because I had it down lower here. And uh, so I've put it up a little higher because I took the egg crate off. It's beautiful blossom. It's, it looks more blue on the, on the video here. Uh, it's really a, a deep, deep purple. And I'm gonna, we're gonna look at these from the back. This is everything from the Box of Joy. Wow, look at all that stuff. I don't know if all of it's gonna make it, um, some of it will, some of it won't, but down there at the end, those two that look dark and that are sticking up, that's Fisherman's Paradise. I'm so excited. Okay, let's go take a look in the basement. Okay, here are those trailers, and they have been on their own now for close to 12 weeks, and they all look pretty good. So, I think we are in the clear there. Here are the plants that were in the tray upstairs. I needed that tray. And uh, so far, so good. Like I meant, uh, some of these were probably a little, like that one, a little bit small to have been taken from their mom and leaf. And here are the rest. They're over here. But um, they're either gonna make it or they're not. And here's a quick look inside. 
this dome it looks like jungle land in there and again i'm i've decided to let these guys go a little bit longer it is heading into winter i'm going to let these guys stay a little bit longer on the mama leaf and uh, give them all a really good chance so and save myself a little time <laughs> and over here is now this is kind of hard to see because the dome is really kind of Let's see if I can turn it a little. It's got a lot of condensation in there. These are, there you can kind of see through there. This is Smithiantha cinnabarina. You saw, um, I showed you that in the first uh, clip here. And I've split them apart and repotted them into my own mix. And on the advice of Dr. Bill Price, I, who is an expert in, in Gisneriads, I've put them, he said, cover them and put them as close to the light as they can be and I was actually going to move the light down a little further but I was I mean I was afraid it might catch on fire it was so close <laughs> the plastic wrap um, not that it's a hot light I mean it's a fluorescent too but uh, that's what's going on in the basement let's go take a look at the big box violet you guys I continue to be so pleasantly surprised by how well this plant is doing and I don't know if it has anything to do with, you know, the plastic sides on the conservatory stand um, because the top is completely open, as you can see. But it is just, it's gorgeous. <laughs> I just keep looking at it and going, wow, it's great. And the soil continues to be moist. And it's still got plenty in there. This has been a great experiment. All right, I'll be right back. So what about it? I had a whole nother tray of leaves and plantlets. Thank you, Derek. What a wonderful gift to have all that stuff come in the mail this week. It was just wonderful. And you can see everything else on the stands doing really well. And uh, I've got the Smithianthus down there. I've never grown Smithiantha before. It's a Smithiantha cinnabarina. Um, I saw one, as I mentioned, at the Missouri Valley Show, and I found some online and ordered them. And uh, we'll see. I got some advice from Dr. Bill Price in Canada about them. He is an expert in in uh, Gisneriads, so I'm crossing my fingers for them. Hopefully, they'll do well. Um, like I said, I've never grown them before, so. Always a new challenge, something new to figure out. The big box violet's looking great, and uh, everybody's looking pretty good. And I've got another whole tray of plants. They'll be putting up babies here pretty soon. I decided to um, to let the plants that already, they're looking pretty, some of them look like they're ready to be separated. I'm gonna give them all a little bit longer. Um, the first ones I separated, some of them, as you could see, were the plants plantlets are still pretty small. And they'll have a better chance of, uh, of surviving if I let them go a little bit longer on the mother leaf, I think. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer on those. But uh, it's time to get the bale money ready. And I'm most excited about um, the uh, Illinois African Violet Society's fall get-together, often called the fall meet here in this area, where um, we all come together as you know members of the IAVS and have a fall meeting. We have speakers that come to talk to us and there'll be some plant sales. Our speakers this year, I'm really excited that Joyce and Kent are coming. Joyce and Kent Stork are coming from Nebraska. Kent will be speaking about, um, about growing plants and Joyce will be talking about design. So the theme of the, of the, of the day is, called, is growth and design. So uh, they'll be here. Kent will have plants for sale. Gary Makita from Gary's Out of Africa will also be at the event and have plants for sale and there'll be a yummy lunch and uh, it only costs 15 bucks. I mean, where else could you get all that for 15 bucks? I, I, it's great. All the info is on the AVSA website if you are in this area and you have been thinking about uh, the Illinois African Violet Society, uh, this would be a great event for you to attend. So go out uh, and register and, uh, and get ready. It'll be great. I'm excited about it. Well, it's time to keep moving forward. It really is. 
Um, I just I want to thank you all for watching every week. This is it just it just gets to be more fun every time I do this. I, I kind of think what am I going to talk about this week, and then I go, oh, this is this sounds good. This will be great. I'll talk about this. So I hope you have I really hope you enjoyed Kent's interview. Um, I've got an interview with Joyce, and I have a couple of others that I was able to get um, when I was in Missouri. So I will be sharing with them with you in the weeks to come. And remember, if you have questions, please leave a comment on the website. And uh, if I don't know the answer, I probably know somebody who will. And uh, I hope that. Um, Oh, and their show notes will be on the website. The um, the stuff that Kent actually uh, talked about, the Neem uh, product that he talked about, is called, you know, i got to look at my notes, it's called Azimax. I found it on Amazon.com, uh, so I will link to that as well in the show notes. As always, the, the podcast is available on the website, allaboutafricanviolence.com. There is an RSS feed there if you'd like to subscribe to it that way. It's also available from Blip TV, and you can also subscribe on iTunes. So I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. I hope your days are filled with all the things you love. Thanks for watching. Good growing. I'll see you next time.